today uh, we have a very interesting and packed program and it's my pleasure to introduce our first plenary speaker today um, which is Ivan um, Kalas. He's a professor of informatics education at Comenius University in Bratislava, Bratislava and visiting professor at University College London um, Institute of Education and the title of his talk will be on the road to sustainable primary programming good morning thank you very much first of all I want to say how I'm honored and really excited about being here and having this chance to share with you my some of my thoughts and experience of both of my group in Bratislava, Slovakia, and now our team uh, from London Knowledge Lab. So I will, I will start by giving a brief overview of my background, which will make it more clear what, I, what my talk will be really about. Uh, so first of all, some of you may probably remember I was involved in development of two big logo projects, logo versions, Comenius logo in the 90s, and then around 2000 we published quite powerful, uh, successful Imagine logo, which has been used for many, many years in many schools and countries. Uh, other important thing is that in Slovakia we managed to introduce mandatory subject we don't call it uh, computer science, we don't call it computing, we call it informatics. And uh, we managed to introduce this in 1985, which is quite some time ago, as a mandatory subject for every student at secondary level, at, at what we could probably, I should say, upper secondary level. And then in 2005, we managed to spread this towards lower grades to uh, lower secondary or middle school, let's say, and in 2008 to primary school. So uh, actually we have quite, quite rich tradition in developing informatics, computer science at school. Uh, we, in, in our department in Bratislava Comenius University, we are involved in building curriculum for this subject. We are also involved in pre-service, in in-service professional development. Uh, designing the content for pupils, and th this is important important part of our professional. Uh, the other thing which I want to mention is this phenomenal Beaver Bebras contest. Uh, you may have heard about it. If not, uh, Valentina and Gerald, who are here and who are they are the founders of this contest, uh, they will run a workshop today, so you have a chance to learn more. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's an international contest in programming, I would say, for the whole range of, of uh, primary, secondary education. And why I'm mentioning it, it here is that uh, in, in our department in Bratislava, we are involved in developing, running this contest in Slovakia. It's very popular there, uh, with almost one half of schools being involved in that. And, uh, I am using this opportunity to analyze the task, programming tasks for very young kids in this contest to better understand the computational concepts in behind. I have the feeling that we still do not quite understand what is difficult, what is not. Uh, we have to learn much more about this and, and evaluating these tasks and comparing them with, with real uh, output difficulty numbers which we get every year is uh, very important for me. Okay, I also think that analyzing this task may uh, give us, inform us uh, how to build content for programming as well. Uh, the other important thing for me is I'm for now about seven, eight years working uh, very intensely with kindergartens. Uh, in, in our country uh, and also internationally for UNESCO I was involved in an analytical study uh, titled Recognizing the Potential of Digital Technologies in Early Childhood Education and we are in, in our team in Bratislava we are also developing uh, software interfaces for learning. Uh, some of them are focused on developing early computational thinking at the age uh, of kindergarten kids. 
Uh, we are also responsible for running national projects in Slovakia, building professional development of, of teachers. Uh, so we manage, for example, to run this, this uh, development program for around 2,000 kindergarten teachers and, and 700 primary teachers. Uh, from September 2014, I, I moved to London. Now I work at, at the London Knowledge Lab. And in the map, you see that uh, what's the geography of these two, two uh, affiliations. Uh, I work in Scratch Math Project, which will be introduced this afternoon by one of uh, our colleagues, Laura. The whole, almost the whole team is here, so I'm very proud to, to, to introduce Celia, Richard, Laura, Dave, and some others, members of the team are, are not here. And we will, I will also mention a little much more about the project later. Uh, as I live now in London, I have a lot of new experience. You can imagine moving from Bratislava to London. Uh, this is very close to where I live. It's very, uh, well, not rich, let's say, area of North London. And there on, on, the, on the pavements, you can really find whatever, not only foxes every day, but for example, books. And as I am, am I'm quite, quite old fashioned in this, I just cannot pass the books lying on the floor, so I, I examined them. Oh, sorry. And uh, there were different books, but one of them was really, really surprising the lost logo. And I thought, hey, moment, well, is this a message to me? What does this mean? And I, I started feel, feeling guilty, which is quite easy for me, uh, asking myself, like, oh, maybe, you know, I'm a logo person with deep logo tradition, logo, well, involved in development and everything, and now I'm working for a Scratch Math Project. Actually, I must say that it's nothing like escaping from Logo anywhere. Uh, well, actually, I moved in both directions, going to working with younger kids, let's say using B-Bots, uh, using Scratch and, and other, other stuff for, for older kids. Actually, I must say that it's quite the opposite. I think this is a very exciting journey, and this is a very important step for me to have this uh, incredible opportunity to work for two years in the project. By the way, it's, it's nothing like escaping from Logo, because Scratch is the latest version of Logo, and we are very happy in our team, uh, based to, on our Logo tradition, we think that some excellent Logo roots should be rediscovered in, in using Scratch at school. Also, I must say that my, my bosses, Celia and Richard, they created incredible conditions for me. So I am living like a hermit in London. Uh, just I escaped from most of my, my professional life back in Slovakia, and I, I have this fantastic opportunity. I must say I have never had that much time to develop any particular content as I have now, so it, it is amazing. So clarifying some, some words. What do I mean when I say educational programming? We all know what professional programming is, more and more people are, we can say, they are end-user programmers, using programming as a tool for their own needs. For example, building quite sophisticated models in Excel. Uh, and a lot of, I would say, serious, difficult programming, but not professional programming. And if we move from there to education, if we, if we, I think we can easily say, and user programming in the context of learning, we can call educational programming. Alan Blackwell uh, gives us a kind of like definition saying that programming is when instead of direct manipulating observable objects, ob observable things, we specify their behavior to occur at some future time. We are planning their, f their future behavior. And this behavior, this plan, probably will be repeated many times, will be run many times, maybe it will be modified, edited, changed, and, and the, this, the, this external representation of the future behavior is the object to think with in, in computing, in, in computer science. Uh, Alan Blackwell also says, 
it is hard because of loss of the benefits of direct manipulation, because we are using special notation to represent these behaviors, programming language, usually formal programming language uh, with exact semantics syntax, and use of abstraction as a tool to handle complexity. It's becoming very popular in several countries again, we are very happy to say so, recognized as a core of computational thinking, which is excellent and we are very happy about this. Uh, it's getting strong support of politicians, which might be dangerous because these things change, but we are happy it's true. And we are also, programming is getting massive interest of public, so this is, this is incredible period. Uh, also, we have new technologies, new, new affordances, new appealing interfaces for learning, physical, uh, virtual. Uh, so, situation is, is very, very productive for building pro programming as a serious subject at school. Uh, also, we now know much more about potential support of other learning objectives through programming. For example, in our project, we are exploring how programming may help developing mathematical thinking from very early age. Uh, finally, I want to clarify what I mean by primary. In, in English educational system, uh, primary is six years, age roughly five to 11, let's say. A key stage one, key stage two. I want to compare it with my situation and you probably in other countries have something, well, some similar. Uh, we have primary starting one year later than in English system and, f and finishing one year earlier, so it fits somehow, somehow into this interval. Also, I want to show here that in, in the UK, computing as a new subject transformed from old ICT uh, with completely new learning objectives was introduced uh, from the day when I arrived to London, <laughs> but it's a coincidence, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, what we are developing in Scratch Math project is uh, computing content for years five and six. So I just want to clarify this, this, this structural thing. And finally, I want to say that Beaver, the contest which I mentioned before, has a lot of categories. The, the youngest category for the youngest kids fits as well to primary and, and partly, let's say, Benjamin category as well. Uh, Official definition of primary, I'm not going to, to proper definition, says it's something f kind of like formalized education starting at the age between five and seven, usually lasting for four to six years. And teachers are most often generalists teaching all subjects, which is not true in all countries, as I recently uh, found out, but it's true for most of the countries. And then the question is, how to build this primary programming in this incredible situation, which is really promising, how to build it in a way it will stay. Because we, some of you and, and some of us, remember waves of interest in programming, and, and sometimes they disappear. And I think this is a chance now that we really start building subject with uh, very strong fundamentals and, and, and uh, sustainable, let's say, well, my ambition is to compare it in future to mathematics, let's say. Okay, so, uh, as I was involved in developing content for different ages, I somehow have, the, the, I feel the need to better understand what it should be for primary. So I was thinking about uh, my experience from kindergartens, experience from working with six, seven years old in, in our country, and then now I am working more for the end of upper end of primary education, and I have the feeling that I need to think about what, hap what was wrong in past, what happened that we should now avoid. So I am trying to, for me, to, to, to clarify something like five important principles for designing and implementing sustainable programming at primary level. Maybe it is a little bit naive, it's just the working, working thoughts, uh, maybe, maybe too early, and generalizing only two very different experiences from different educational structures, situations, but maybe, maybe it may inspire a kind of discussion. So 
uh, I am just thinking what are the factors that, that we must very carefully take into consideration when implementing this primary programming. And of course, it, it's quite tempting to go into this didactic triangle, uh, thinking about pupils, teachers, and content. Although I was not very happy, I must say, in this case, because I think it's very important to focus in more detail in, on content. And I would here say that this node should be divided into three other things. Computing, computational tool, and, and content-specific pedagogy for primary programming. Actually, I, I don't like this structure. It, it looks a little bit like, like free Masonic secret thing, so I'm not going to use it. But in general, I am going to think about pupils, teachers, computing, computational tool, and primary programming pedagogy. So first, first, which is incredibly important experience for me, I have, for myself, I have completely new view on how we must respect primary pupils. Uh, most of previous research efforts in programming in 80s, 90s happened out of school. I don't want to say all of them, but most of them or in somehow selective settings, for example, working with gifted, gifted kids, or somehow selective circumstances, which I, what I mean here, for example, in 1995, we started experimental informatics programming course in Slovakia in, in one school. We developed the content, academicians. We were giving the content. So we learned a lot. It was excellent experience, but actually very small impact on everyday situation in everyday school. Uh, this is one thing. The other thing is that, and it was clearly wrong, and I think that you all will easily agree with this, we were very much focused on these five, six brilliant kids who always knew, and we were happy to support them and go on. Now in our project and in our new situation, uh, for me, it's a completely new experience. We, are, we have to carefully think about every kid in the class, exactly like we do, for example, in mathematics. Uh, when we were developing Thomas the Clown, this environment, programming environment for kindergartens, we started already applying different approach. Uh, this, this is, this is the, the screen of this environment. Uh, at the top, you see symbolic representation of future trip of Thomas the Clown. Uh, here you can see he's sitting at crocodile and he wants to get to an elephant and kids are programming, he's planning his trip there. And teachers in kindergartens in Slovakia are using this, they, are, they really like it. Although they, I must say, they have probably no idea that they are programming with kids. They are using these environments for talking about animals, to talking about fruits, because we have different versions, different worlds of this environment. Uh, in this, when we were developing Thomas the Clown, we were working with kids aged five to six, and all the time, from the very beginning, we were working with these kids. So it was development really happening in, in the middle of, of those for whom we were developing. Design-based research, development with teachers and children. And we were also thinking about, uh, to learn for us how to develop. So it was more experience, not only creating Thomas the Clown, but learning how software for young kids, maybe not only young, uh, should be developed. Uh, now in our Scratch Math project, I would say for me it's an ultimate transition from isolated academic development. For the first time we are working with teachers from the very, very beginning. So I'm, I'm not really going to give you the, the main goals of Scratch Math on very, very, very briefly, because Laura will, will present this later in the afternoon. And actually, I'm, but I will use this, this project as a source of examples I want to show. So we started working with four design schools from the very beginning, uh, running interactive, iterative design with them. Now we are working with more than 100 regular state schools, divided into 50 and 50. Uh, we, ha we have conducted two days professional development for teachers for the first 50, and uh, the second 50 is moved, delayed by one year so that we can compare well, actually not we, it will be independently tested at the end of year six, and year five and year six. 
before we before we went to well before we started this development of course i wanted to know what's happening in scratch world already so i tried to collect every possible source using scratch and i analyzed analyzed these sources thank you uh, actually it was an experience I, you you probably know that when we are developing programming content one one of many possible criteria to look at the material is to find out in which way and when condition is introduced because this is tricky thing and we are not quite sure how these things should happen so one of the things which i do whenever i study such material i have a detailed look how conditions conditions are introduced and this is one example from one book uh, where if construction and well a bit conditional is used for the first time so this is the first script first time the reader meets condition and the reader before this situation already used when green flag clicked block and say so what is new in this step is if forever mouse down mouse x y touching edge uh, this is one point new blocks but look at the concepts for a computational point of view this is construction of using condition in conditional going to using these reporter blocks two of them in the parallel for the first time having structure forever if which we call whenever structure if inside if if with a, another block and followed by if so these are incredibly incredibly complex concepts which are just thrown on the reader in one step so i couldn't resist in this example and i started playing a little bit in scratch okay so this is this is the script uh, i will maybe switch is it readable i hope yes okay so i am going to decompose, decompose a little bit and the, the first big thing here uh, is go to mouse x mouse y i don't know what this means i i want to i want to find out i want to explore so i just start from bits what is mouse x i click it 240 I move it somewhere else, 240. Why, what is this number? Uh, of course, you, most of you know, but if I want to discover by myself what it is, I need some way from small bits towards to, to outside. So let's say I, I would use say to see, it is 240, it's very small for you, I will make it a little bigger. Uh, I want. I want to explore what will happen when I move my mouse. So I move my mouse and now I see that it reacts to my movements from left to right. So of course it is X, X uh, coordinate. Uh, I may improve it by using, let's say, X. Okay, so I, I can study coordinates. If I like this, I may duplicate and and change behavior here so that this shows y coordinate i am not going into that it would it would take long time okay so i stop this i stop this and instead of say i am going to use go to with one of these reporters so okay so now we see that the, the sprite forever follows my movement of the x coordinate this is let's say fine nice so then i have i i try to to do the same for both i can also expect i i, I would hope for kids experimenting with these for example replacing the coordinates and some of you, Celia Richard, Ken, would remember this happened many times, discovering uh, th this funny, funny behavior when you replace, uh, I think it was in Toon Talk, when kids were discovering this transition of the transforming uh, coordinates. Okay, so now I will add uh, 
point towards mouse cursor. And if I run this, I already can control, let's say, my sprite. Okay, and so I will build a script of this. And another, another very inno new thing here is this if and mouse down. So I have, to, I have to explore what mouse down is. Actually, I think I can get rid of this. And it, it, this is not easy. This is condition, of course, it, it can, you can read it, mouse down. So let, let's use it in a structure. At, at the time when we are exploring with kids such things in year six, they already know this structure, which we call whenever, whenever something happens, react somehow, or another version, whenever else. So whenever mouse is pressed down, I may, for example, turn pen down, otherwise turn pen up, and I turn this into another script. So I have two scripts now. I run them. Okay, and I will make it a little bit slower by replacing this go to by move small step. So now I have I can control the, 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 the beetle in that way. And actually it's very tempting now to start practicing tie letters. I practice so much and you know it's not not perfect Oof okay I <laughs> I I spent a couple of nights talking to our night porter at the hotel discussing the letters so it was very inspiring for me uh, what, what I wanted to illustrate, this was a kind of like exhibition, I know, but I was decomposing something which reader got in one step. I turned it into exciting sequence of things, of steps, leading to something incredibly powerful, I would say. So I go back to, to my, my PowerPoint. This is my best, my master, master stick. This, is, this, is, this was the last night, uh, and I hope it, it has a good meaning. Uh, well, I would say this means the first word, well, no, I, I, am, I, don't, I don't want to go into it, but this is something like I love, I adore, I, I, I'm, is it true? I hope. <laughs> okay, this is what I wanted to say. Uh, so key design, key design principles, in my first principle, key, the intervention must address all pupils, all pupils in the class of all attainment levels. The intervention must allow for diversity, differentiation. When I see some of those scratch materials, I just ask myself, are our kids in our schools, I mean now in London, are they different? They cannot be different, and these things are so difficult for them. So I analyzed most what I could find in scratch literature. I, I, I set a kind of like eight rubrics. These, these are just examples. Who is the audience? How is the content presented? Is it tool oriented, teaching scratch, or is it final product oriented, building process oriented, computing oriented, math thinking oriented? And some of my observations, uh, very rarely these materials are developed for, for schools, that, that's okay. Very rarely, very rarely focused on primary school. Uh, the concept of turtle geometry, which we find very important, is completely, almost completely lost. Uh, all authors but one, I would say, well, they, they never mention it, so it may mean they, they are not familiar with it. In one book it was explicitly stated that this is something very improper for school. Uh, also, what, what I saw is that in Scratch version 2.0, the new incredibly powerful things which are there are rarely used, for example, making new blocks. The idea of syntonicity, 
which you may remember from Simmer Pepper, he called it body syntonicity. Uh, sometimes I think nowadays some people say embodiment uh, means that we support the pedagogy to encourage kids to identify with the object they are planning programming. Uh, so it is not present direct drive approach, very rare. I will explain what I mean by this. And what I would call concepts dosage is overdosing. Uh, too many things jumping, I mean jumping uh, by chunks of, of concepts. The other principle is uh, respect primary teachers. Uh, these are most often generalists, not specialists in certain subjects, which I think is one of the most exciting things of what we are doing, because they know, they, they are e immediately ready to build all bridges between programming and other things happening at school, which I think is, is in our project is very important. Uh, based on our professional development sessions, my impression when I compare teachers with, let's say, my, my experience from Slovakia, uh, they are in general digitally literate. They, it's true, I really appreciate this. Uh, very rarely they have any pre-service background in computing. Some of them have some previous knowledge of Scratch, usually in the game building style, copy and paste style, but they are, not but, another point is they are masters in primary pedagogy. They are really excellent, they are deeply engaged, thoroughly considering potential benefits of any new content and method. Uh, for me, it's a big lesson because I was naively somehow waiting for universities to produce new primary teachers who will come to schools and they will be able to program. I, I, I don't think this, well, I don't know. I'm not waiting for this anymore. So we have to rely on professional development, in-service professional development, usually very short. So it is very important to develop this content directly with the teacher, not for them, to trial it, not trial it instead of them, but let them trial it and just observe and improve the content. Uh, so professional development must prove the intervention is relevant for them and appropriate. And here I want to quote, uh, I think, excellent, excellent, uh, idea from, from Richard and Celia, we have to foster a sense of teacher ownership of an innovation. If we, if we do not manage to do this, we will never get them feel they want to improve, they want to build their confidence and, and continue. Uh, then I'm moving to the third of, of the original uh, triangle, the third node, which I want to, to divide into three things. And again, Streets of London wanted to tell me something. Uh, less is more. Actually, you know, it, it's tempting to say things like this, but I, now I learn from the first example that streets of London are trying sometimes to, to, to cheat me. Actually, I don't think this is, this is cheap. This is cheap. It's not less is more. We have to look for what is proper, what is proper, not what is less. So, but still, I, I was happy to, to see this, this garbage truck. So we have to think about which computational concepts and why, how they are implemented in tool, how to mediate them to pupils. And from the pupils' point of view, why do I need this particular concept? What I'm going to use it for? What I'm going to create with this? How does it fit into my computational thinking? So I, I think that it's important to distinguish content, to, 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 to look inside it and see this structure of three things and be very careful to keep balance between these three, these three items. Because if we divert towards tool, we, we, have, we have a word for this for a long time, technocentrism. I'm very afraid of diverting towards computing too much because quite considerable part of literature of this modern computing movement has a connotation of we hope you will become our computer science future students. And I don't care about this. I think that what we are building in our project, in, in our effort, is using computing to help kids learn a lot of different things just to, to, to grow and develop. Also, if it diverts towards pedagogy too much, it may happen that, that, not, that, that the learning of programming is very shallow. So it is important to negotiate balance between computing, computational tool, and learning. 
So now I jump into one of first of them, respect computing. Uh, it is important to distinguish between tool, between computing and computational tool, and yet there is an incredibly strong in, uh, dependency. When we choose a tool, it will influence, it should influence uh, what, what, we, what kind of concepts from, computa from computing we are going to, to, to build. Uh, Specific content should be built on developmentally appropriate concepts which are properly, properly implemented, interpreted in the tool. I'm not going to say what is proper content. This is not the, to the goal of, of my talk. I want to reflect on sustainable programming, primary programming design principles, not, not uh, on specific content. So I am thinking, I, I already saw a lot of different approaches, let's say. What's, what, what, should, what, could be, what could be, what could be, what could happen in programming at primary level? And I, I'm trying to build, uh, to clarify this unclear, uh, unclear space of opportunities to give it certain structure, which I call com conceptual framework for primary programming. And it's a kind of like attempt to structure the space of opportunities. So I feel and probably it's, it's far from, from complete, but I, I am able to identify these three factors. Actor, control, and interaction. First thing divides the whole space of opportunities in primary programming into controlling physical actor, controlling virtual actor. Uh, by control, I mean direct manipulation, which means I take the toy, I take the robot, I move it in my hand. Direct dry, a drive, I give a command and it is immediately interpreted and then I build future behavior. So if we, if we place overlay, overlay these, these two things, we are already getting six subspaces of this space, but still I think it's quite important to distinguish between building opportunities when we are controlling one actor or multiple actors with interactions. So, uh, probably this division has no meaning in all of these subspaces, I, I, I would say no, but this, this is not so important now. So I, I think that, uh, well, some, maybe some examples, physical actor, virtual actor. Physical actor can be any wooden toy, wooden toy, or B-Bot, or, or any other programmable toy which is used in, 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 in many countries, in many kindergartens. Then Bebot may move on screen and become virtual. Uh, Thomas the Clown, another virtual actor. These are multiple actors from another of our interfaces for kindergarten kids uh, developing mathematical thinking. Then when, I, when we say direct manipulation, direct drive and programming, what do I mean? Teachers in kindergartens often encourage kids to solve problems by moving the toy, then by pressing the button. So the moving the toy by your hand is direct manipulation. As soon as I start pressing the button in a, in a situation, uh, I'm giving it a control in what we call direct drive, direct drive mode. Uh, then I can increase the distance between my button, my tool to control and the effect. So for example, here the kids in Chile are using remote control to control the robotic, robotic tool. And then, and this is excellent example because it, well, for me, it, I am very excited about this because there is no external representation of Bbots program. So this is what one of the teachers came with, this idea of building programs and just, you can then keep the record, you can think as, uh, with, as, with an object of, of, of future plan. Uh, okay, so this war was more programming in a physical, physical tool. Uh, also in Scratch, of course, we can, uh, well, I will, I will jump there once more. So what I mean with these words in, in Scratch, let's say working with virtual actor, this is direct, well, this is what we call direct manipulation. I can drag, then of course I can move. 
So this is direct drive, and then I can start building behavior. And we always go through all of these steps if if it is possible. So, for example, if I go into costumes, I will find out that this sprite has sequence of costumes, and in in so-called direct manipulation mode, I just explore them. And I see that this is the idea of, of animation. So what I did in direct drive, I, in direct manipulation, I can also run in direct drive. So I can run this next costume block. So I can, I can uh, repeat this, let's say, 100 times. Well, it's, it's pretty quick, so then I explore, I try with delay. Okay, so it looks quite good. Then I add a small movement. And then I, I will run into situation when the sprite will, will hit the edge. Oops. Okay, so I will have to use also bouncing from the, from, from the edge. And in a way, I build a kind of like animation, simple animation. I will stop it here. Oops. Okay, uh, so in a similar way, we are building all the concepts of planning future interactions of two virtuals, uh, virtual actors. Uh, I, I think I, I don't have time to, to, to go deeper here. So how do we make this framework work for us? We must be aware of all spaces of these uh, this subspaces of primary programming and exploit all opportunities they offer. Explore all opportunities. Do not neglect these opportunities, to rush through them. Uh, we have to use them for planning systematic development of concepts, developing pedagogical strategies, designing classifying tasks. In a way, it may look a little bit, well, there is a very slight resemblance to Bloom taxonomy because it, it gives certain space. But uh, it is important to realize that they are, these columns are not ordered. It, there is nothing like some, one of them, physical or virtual, should come first. Uh, on the other hand, doing things by hand is definitely much easier and natural than giving a command, than building a behavior. So there is certain order in, in the rows, but no order in, in the columns. Uh, we have to use this, this, well, we can use this conceptual framework for constructing meanings of concepts, for transforming the concepts through tools, which is very important, and I think we are often forgetting if we are using Bbot to build simple linear sequences of commands, and then we move to any other environment, Scratch Junior, Scratch or whatever, we have to clarify which concepts there, happening there, are now, what, what kind of form they have now in the new tool. So it's very important. Uh, I'm, I'm here using one of, again, a mutation of, of one of Celia's and Richard's term. Uh, I think that this is the danger of lethal timing for a tool. What's happening in the UK, for example, in many schools, teachers start using Scratch in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, and year six in parallel. And Probably it is possible, I don't want to say it's not possible, but it means, first of all, they will not be, they will not be able to use proper affordances of Scratch if it comes too early. And the other thing is they will use the time which should have been spent building simpler concepts by, well, let's say, wasting this opportunity. So it, we have to be careful in this, I, I would say. So how we... In, in our project, how we structure big ideas of computing. There are different strategies, and several of them were already mentioned here in the conference. Uh, key concepts of computational thinking by, by let's say, Wing, Janet Wing, or uh, Karen Brennan, Mitch Resnick. In national curriculum, there is another classification. Actually, we, we, it's useful for our project to organize them in what we call big ideas of computing at the primary level. And we use this system of classic, well, in, for, na, for us internally, we, we use it to structure the content of professional development as well. Actors and their attributes, data, commands and expressions, programs, 
uh, processes and corresponding practices like sequences, loops, conditions, conditionals, parallelism, randomness, events, communication, <coughs> and what is incredibly important, abstraction, which means defining, increasing the level of the language we are using, which means building new blocks in the context of, of Scratch. Okay, so uh, probably last, last time I, I, I jump into Scratch. Okay, so uh, here, we, we, this is one, one bit of, of our content we are developing here. The activity starts by discovering how we can draw a dot. So drawing a dot in Scratch is, means pen down, pen up. Uh, so if I, if I run this script, there is a dot. Okay, so then I can and this is what we really encourage kids and in, uh, teachers are encouraging kids to do. If this is a dot, let's call it a dot. So this is my dot, this is my definition. And our approach in our pro in Scratch Bench pro project is build a script, deb debug it, use it, explore it, give it a name, you keep this definition, and then use this shortcut this abbreviation for drawing dots. Then I can repeat drawing dot, for example, 10 times, moving 15. Okay, so I can draw a line. Uh, in the similar way, and actually I move here, in the similar way I can play and discover how to draw short dash. Uh, so I, I, I will, let's try if it works properly, oops. Okay, it's a dash, so I can now use, oops, sorry, I haven't made a block so far. So I have these new, new blocks, dash and dot. And now I am going to, to build a line of dots, line of dashes. I can start experimenting with using turn inside this. So for example, I am going to turn 10 by 10, repeating 36. In our approach, we pay a lot of attention to building understanding between what we call repeat number and what's happening inside. So. Uh, how much should the, the object, the, the beetle, turn so that it covers the whole whole turn? So we can draw a circle. Actually, when we were last week, we I was visiting one of our schools, and there was incredible discussion. The teacher asked all kids to come and sit on the carpet, and they were discussing building these definitions. And one of the girls asked, what would happen if now, as I already defined these new blocks, I just delete it? And it was very nice discussion, thinking uh, and discussing, well, what, what then this shortcut dash and dot would mean? Uh, so, and another discussion, which was very difficult, I must say, and teacher was not quite, the, the girl was not able to clearly un formulate the answer. She had the feeling that if I run this script, then at least one of the dots must be drawn twice. And she was trying to, to argument and the teacher was not quite able to, to, to solve this situation. So uh, then they were asked to build similar script for, oops, uh, similar, similar script for uh, using dash. Okay, it's too big. Okay, and from here we moved to, well, I don't know how much time do I have, maybe not too much, so I, I, I should skip some details. You may see there are many other blocks already defined, so why not to try to experiment with them a little bit? 
So I, we start using these blocks in our circle. And actually, this gave incredibly nice discussion about how the order of blocks is important. So if I, for example, set a, pen, a random color and then just change, change shades inside, I'm giving this circle of dots. So uh, I can now, in direct manipulation style, discover there are other backdrops. So I'm going to use this backdrop now, and I'm, I'm going to modify the script so that there is no movement, but jumping to random position. Okay, or, oops, or if I move this block inside, a lot of these colorful blodges. And then the, the activity is to try to turn this into a night, night sky of stars. And why it's not so, it, why it doesn't look like a night, night, night sky of stars. And, and actually all, all reasons were properly identified by kids, size, colors, shades. We also discovered that there, there is uh, another backdrop with what we call night horizon. So if we now start drawing proper color, for example, I don't know, this may be proper for, for stars. So it's, let's say, it's getting better, but still the size is not good. It's, these are random blocks. How is it possible that they, they, are, they work like this? And kids, they know that as far as through the whole of our content, we are encouraging them to build definitions. So they know that blocks here in this group must be somewhere defined. The definitions are here. So they start reading the definitions and then modifying the definitions. So for example, if I change random size, to something like this, it will be, let's say, better. Uh, pen color, I'm not going to change. Pen shades, okay, so now I run it again. Then the only problem is this horizon, and we have to play with coordinates to find out how the random positions are defined. So I have to find out what, what is this horizon value. It's, I think it's something like minus 60. Okay, so I will stop with scratch here. And, and maybe just I should quickly rush through uh, some key design principles uh, we should experience, understand, and appreciate mechanisms for thinking about computational processes. View actors as things to control, individual commands as a means to achieve reactions, commands as atomic blocks for building programs, programs as explicit representations of future behavior, abstractions as shortcuts, sending messages as an instrument for collaboration. If we move now quickly to tool, we have to respect the, what the tool is giving us. Uh, so here I want to mention that if we d divert to, towards tool too much, we, we say, well, there is a danger of technocentrism. If we are not using tool at all, we can still do a lot of interesting things and actually Bebra's comp computational thinking contest, and you see here these Im impressive numbers, uh, is doing this. They are programming examples, not using any programming tool. Uh, and I, I was lazy to really translate the whole text. But there are two beavers, Dave and Pierce. They behave, they are controlled by this language. And here is a program. And they start running this program in parallel. How many coins, and these numbers represent the number of golden coins in each of these, these squares. How many coins will peers collect running this program? Uh, I will give you one minute later for this, if you want. Uh, okay, so we believe that this approach is excellent. I 
complement, and we are using these unplugged activities, a lot of different versions, styles of activities are even in our content. Uh, we have to respect developmental appropriateness of computational tool. We should, I would say, we should not use it too early. We should not use it too late. We should not use it too long, is my, 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 my feeling. I, and I refer again to this lethal timing effect. Uh, we have to identify and understand and use affordances of the tool for learning. Uh, the way how these concepts are implemented in, in the tool. So, for example, excellent way how in Scratch you can control keyboard. Instead of building this difficult, difficult structure forever, if I am touching the edge, turn backwards, you have this if on edge bounce. So, these are affordances which would be really pity not to use. Having these pair of pairs of blocks, set pen size, for example, set pen size, change pen size by, and the same working with variables. These are affordances which should be taken in, into consideration because they are really properly created using next costume and so on. Uh, it is important to explore functionality of a block in a direct drive, give meaningful names, which again in Scratch is incredibly generous. You can give proper names, not just one word, to whatever you want so that it is readable. It's very important that the scripts we are building are elegant, are readable. Uh, in our Scratch Match projects, we are organizing from the tool point of view uh, the concepts into objects, blocks, scripts, and, and project, how the project is executed, managed, and so on. Very briefly, I just uh, will probably jump through this pedagogy content the con node because in our afternoon presentation of the project, we will mostly focus on, on this point. Uh, the only thing I wanted to say that uh, we identified in our project uh, as a very important principle what we call five E's teaching framework consisting of five constructs, explore, envisage, explain, exchange. The, the, five, the fifth one is a little bit tricky. It's bridge. Uh, okay, I think I will, I will rush through this. The last thing I want to show you, but not in Scratch, just using pictures. Uh, we have to create good contexts. Contexts that are supporting creativity of kids. And I have one nice example from our school, which I witnessed, two, I, I, I observed two weeks ago, when we, the, the teacher was building these, these circles of dots and dashes, and there were some excellent discussions about order of, of blocks. I'm not going into that, but one of the kids reacted saying, this looks like bracelet. And the teacher said, yes, no, he, doesn't, he didn't use this opportunity. But I, I had a discussion with him after that lesson. And it was very clear that I had the feeling that as soon as he increases his confidence, confidence in using the tool, he will use these suggestions from kids. So I played a little bit instead of him. And it is so natural to generalize this script, which has three, four blocks, into drawing bracelets. So I was playing with different shapes. And these are bracelets. And I'm almost sure that next year, when we go to that school, there will be, maybe not bracelets like this, other surprises. Because these teachers, they are so creative. As soon as they build their confidence, and they believe that what they are, they are doing is really important for their kids. They are incredibly, incredibly creative. So last slide. Summing up, programming is getting more attention once again, and we are very excited about this in very early stages, even in early childhood education in my country, for example. And what is really interesting for, for us, how to contribute to its sustainability. I have the feeling that now in computing, in programming, we are somewhere as biology was before Carl von Linné. There was no system, no system of plants and organisms. And 250 years ago, he introduced a system, and we could start it like categorizing things. We are not that far in computing, I'm afraid, so far. We need these frameworks to build them, to understand, to, to help us understand what is difficult and why, what should become before other concepts. 
identify aspects to be considered, which I, I, I'm also trying to do, maintain balance within the content between computing, computational tool, teaching strategies, identify and exploit design principles which work, and, and of course, run a lot of research on educational programming. We are just at the beginning. Uh, and rely on primary teachers, because there is incredible potential. I am so happy we have a chance to work with them. My very last sentence here wants to say, and more, probably some of you remember our team presenting things in Eurologo conferences. We often, well, we were developing new stuff, and we were showing you what's possible. And now I think we are building, we are much more modest, and we are building what's doable with every child in the class, which is, I think, the main important point here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan. Um, do we have any questions? Yep. Gary? Is there an actual instrument that you're using for that? Is there an instrument that you're using to measure the, the, the progress in computational thinking? I, I, I don't think so. We, well, I don't think we are that, that far now. We, we don't have an instrument to measure. Well, actually, we are starting building these progression frameworks. Is, is it, well, I'm not quite sure if I really got it, Gary. Is it the thing which I... Yeah, if, if I'm a you know, government minister or someone demanding evidence, mm -hmm. are, is there some way that you're measure, showing that this is benefiting children? Oh yes, this is the main goal of our project, of course. And, and actually, there are several strategies. One is that an independent institution in the UK is measuring the effects through running a computational test with all these 100 schools in, in, after first year. After second year, they will be compared based on standard math tests, which are called SATs in England. So this is one strategy. We have another, we are, we are applying in our team a qualitative method, observing, uh, defining learning objectives, defining the ways how to, to observe if they are met. This is, I think, I hope this is what you... <laughs> yes, Gerald? Microphone, please. Uh, Ivan, you gained a lot of experience in primary schools and what I'm... and I like this... Uh, this uh, what you're doing that is not so complex. You have step by step doing the concepts. And what I'm wondering, if you want to spread it over, the, over all schools, to do it at the large scales in thousands of schools, how can we support the teachers and how we can educate the teachers? Yeah, <clears throat> very good question, thank you. Of course we want this to happen. This is what, why we are investing so much effort in this development. Uh, now we are working with 100 schools. We are developing materials with teachers. We are running this short, I would say very short, two days PD sessions. And we are developing materials for teachers. And then it's on their own. So if, if the program, when, when the, our project is finished, everything will be open. And then, well, it depends on the strategy, but I, I, I hope that thousands of schools will apply this strategy and will start using it. It is prepared in such a way that if there is this, let's say, two days professional development, the teachers are able to start applying this in their schools. Actually, you know, I, when I heard we had only two days, I was horrified. I thought this is impossible. It is possible. It is possible. If the teachers are positive, if they, if they want, you can, this is not professional development where you teach them scratch or where you teach them programming. You just have to show them the potential. 
As soon as they adopt the belief that this is, use, this is important for their kids, you are the winner then. And what happened very often in, in several places, teachers who were already using Scratch in this game-like style, they often say, said they have to first unlearn and then relearn, because very often this game building approach in narrow sense because building games is amazing important of course uh, often gives no opportunity for systematic learning so we have to find a good, good balance between these um, another question Ken in the back yeah uh, very very nice talk and the, the ideas you presented <coughs> the content all of it and, and the, way, the idea of, of moving it to teachers. But my question is, what, how much of what you've learned would apply where there's no teacher, where you've just got a nice interactive tutorial in which maybe a child at home or maybe in school where the teacher doesn't want to be involved, how much of what you're talking about could, be, could work as just a standalone interactive tutorial? I see. Ken, our... What, what we are developing is meant for schools. It's very, the whole pedagogy around it is working in large group, working in pairs. All the materials are developed for teachers. Of course, these materials contain working sheets for kids and a lot of materials to be given to kids. Also some what we call starter projects, which they use. So actually, we, we are not really building this material for the use you are asking for. What is happening, many of, not many, some of these kids in our schools are work, playing with Scratch at home, and then they come and, and report what they manage to continue at home. So, but it is all based, school-based. Ryan? Um, so I'm curious about what you think developmentally appropriate concepts are. Uh, in the examples you showed us, um, there are conditionals. Uh, there are reporters like Mouse X. Um, no variables. Is that, I mean, do kids? No, do? no. Uh, actually, we are using reporters as a way to introduce variables, and we are intensively working with variables in year six. All of my examples were from year five. Ah, okay. And actually, what's, I'm sorry, what's that in age? Uh, nine to 11, so. I the, see, okay. Uh, but Brian, you know, I, I, it, was my in, it was my decision not to name the concepts which we consider to be appropriate, because I don't think there is such proper answer. For example, one teacher asked me if it is appropriate to introduce uh, making new blocks with parameters. And I have no answer for this. In our approach, we don't do that because we, we decided to go in different, let's say, directions. Of course, it's incredibly powerful concept. It must come. It must come. But we thought maybe not in our, in our, context, in our content, in our interventions, it, it will come later, not in year five, year six. But I'm not saying this should not be there. We are not that far. One last question. Yep. Thanks uh, very much for that. One of the things I was really struck by was this idea of um, sort of slowing down, taking time to really exploit and, and explore the different spaces of ways kids can, can play in here. And I'm wondering, there's, there's a real tension there between um, giving kids an opportunity to explore and to play and you know, making sure they get coverage that we want. We've got to make sure they get the variables, make sure they, they, they're naming things properly. What are some sort of techniques or strategies that you could share with us that you've kind of um, gotten teachers to buy into this idea of taking time and of letting kids explore that space? Yeah, this is a very good question. Actually, we will spend much more time answering your question in, in, in our well, smaller paper presentation. Uh, we are trying to achieve this by following this 5E principle. And actually, it's, a, it's, it's not easy. It's a kind of like maybe the most difficult thing to find proper balance between this open 
constructivist environment where they are exploring and when they are scaffolded. So we believe that in the situation when, in a way, the level of programming knowledge of teachers is very low, then the scaffolding must be relatively tight. So we define something like learning objectives, like steps in this progression, which are not far away. But we are trying to give as much freedom from going from one to another as possible. And in every module, at the end, there is an open activity. So we are trying to find this balance. And definitely kids, they need to experiment. They need to discover things. In every school, every time, it happens that as soon as they start using repeat blocks, they try what will happen if you say repeat and then you press nine and you keep, and, and it goes, you know, like 25 nines, what will happen? Well, and you, you just have to let them do these things, but you have to carefully scaffold and, and give them these structures step by step. Okay, well, thank you, Ivan. Uh, next. <laughs> next, I'd like to invite um, Ajahn Yupin, the school's provost, to uh, present Ivan with a small gift of appreciation. <laughs> 